I would, I would see the beauty of the stuff on offer in Europe. Mm -hmm. And then I would look at the selection at Nordstrom and see a huge disparity between yeah, there was what a the world offered and what we in America offered. Yeah. And, I said, and then, of course, many Europeans are always bad mouthing American style and, you know, sometimes for good reason. But there are Americans who can dress, but we don't always have access That's right. to good stuff. Mm. And so I wanted to change that. I wanted to see Americans dressing better and I wanted it to start at the feet. And it tells me, okay, drop this line here, do this here, make them pull the pattern forward. And it tells me all these things that I wouldn't have a clue about. Mm. My, yep. my dad actually gave me that name. Uh, my dad was a very smart businessman. At first I wanted to name it something very boring. <laughs> the, I said the shoe aficionado. And my dad said, That's so boring. Who <laughs> wants to read the shoe aficionado? Right. You need to be the shoe snob. Hello, ladies and gentlemen and friends, and welcome to this new edition of Sotorial Talks. Today, I'm a very happy man. Why? Because I have a man at my table in our house in Bourgogne, France, which I can say, who I can say is a very dear friend of mine. And many of you know him. If you are into the shoes, luxury shoes, the world of Sotorial shoes, you know Justin Fitzpatrick, also known as the shoe snob. And the shoe snob, yes, ladies and gentlemen, is sitting at my table today hello my friend justin hello. how do you do brother very happy to be here very good thank you finally uh, we know each other since we were browsing our memories yesterday night and i think you pinned it is 2011 something yeah, like that early 2011 yeah. yeah so justin well if you don't know the shoe snub first of all you should go online the shoe this is probably one of the biggest resource on luxury shoes and quality shoes in the world uh, you started this blog in 2011 To 2010. 2010. Uh, actually, the shoe snob blog .com. Uh, The shoe snob blog .com. Yeah. And then it evolved into a shoe brand, just J. Fitzpatrick Footwear. But we're going to talk extensively about this during this episode. But first of all, I want that we browse our memory because I know a lot of people are interested to know, first of all, who you are, where do you come from, and how a man who was born in Seattle, right, ended up at the first time, first of all, in Italy to learn shoemaking and then in England at Gives and Oak to learn shoe shining and eventually build his own brand. Can you tell us a little bit about your, your path? How did it begin for you? What, what is the, the first, the first um, click that was in your mind to say, okay, I'm going to become a shoemaker? Well, I guess the, the, the original goal was just to be my own boss. Okay. I just wanted to have my own company and I, w I didn't want to work for other people. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, my dad always told me you're successful if you're happy with what you do. And so that's what that's what was in my mind. I wanted to own my own company and be happy in what I did. And okay. so I thought, okay, I have to f do something that I'm passionate about that I enjoy. And I always loved dressing uh, and especially love shoes. Part of that become since you were a kid. You yeah, because in that? Uh, well, the problem is it's whether you're interested or not, it's, it's forced on you in American youth culture, where oh. if you're not wearing the latest sneakers, you okay. cannot be cool. Hmm. So you're automatically forced into this world if you want to be cool. Hmm. So, you know, when I'm 10 and 11 and 12, I was looking for the latest Nike the latest oh, right. shoe of this so mm -hmm. I could be accepted into the cool crowd. Mm -hmm. So you, you, it starts with shoes and whether you want to take it to your clothes is another story. And so obviously as I grew up and I evolved and I was in university, I was working at a, a department store, Nordstrom. Okay. Uh, oh, Nordstrom, very, Nordstrom, very big chain of department big chain. store everywhere. Yeah. And they are also from Seattle. So I was working in the number one, it's called the number one because it was the first one okay. and it's one of the largest ones and uh i was working in the men's shoe floor and and at this time i was i wanted to learn everything i could about menswear and clothing and shoes so i would read all the magazines every single one i even bought a quarterly magazine and, I, and it no longer exists And I think it was just called menswear. And okay. It was really good. There was no advertising. Yeah. It was just pure. I, I know what you're feeling about that because me, when I started in 2005 or six, I was trying to to buy even 
old fashioned magazine from the 50s, find anything we can yeah. find because there was not a lot of things no. on the subject. Mm. But let me ask you the question you were in Nordstrom while you were in college. So it was like yeah. a, a, a job, uh, um, uh, how do you call this, a student job, right? Yeah, it was, you know, so I could make some money. I was a full time student, but, I, you know, I, w I wanted to buy myself stuff, so I needed to work. Okay. You know, and so I worked part time mm -hmm. uh, in the nights, you know, school by day, work by night. Okay. And uh, and so yeah, I would read all these magazines, and I would read, I would I would see the beauty of the stuff on offer in Europe, mm -hmm. and then I would look at the selection at Nordstrom, and see a huge disparity between yeah, there was what a the world offered and what we in America offered. <laughs> yeah. And, I, and then of course, many Europeans are always bad mouth in American style and you know sometimes for good reason. But there are Americans who can dress, but we don't always have access. That's right. To good stuff. Mm. If you live in the middle of Arkansas, for mm. example, yeah. how can you, you know, and this is obviously before the, the fact you can buy something on your phone with three clicks. Of course. This was no Instagram, no nothing, mm. no internet uh, purchasing. Uh, we have nothing against Arkansas. We could say the same in Michigan <laughs> or yeah. whatever. You know, Just trying to really pick a place far away from everything. <laughs> yeah. And, you know. I thought, how can guys who are not able to just fly to to Paris or London or Italy to buy nice stuff, how can they have access to yes. stuff? Because Nordstrom was clearly not providing, and what I felt, the the real beauty of what's on offer, they were just buying the, the cheap, safe stuff that they knew they could churn out to millions of men who yeah. know no better. Mm. And a salesman just tells you a bunch of things that's not real. And so I wanted to change that. I wanted to see Americans dressing better, and I wanted it to start at the feet. You so were a pioneer. We can say that at the time, because there were no many, uh, at least in the blog industry, that people to inform people about what's going on in the shoe industry outside of the U.S. They were, you were the first. Yeah. Like I said, in America, you were among the first, let's say. Among the first, yeah. yeah. I mean, as a pure shoe guy, yeah. definitely the first. Obviously, there was the suitable wardrobe and the people. Yeah, but he was prior. talking of uh, uh, clothes. Yeah, yeah, everything. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And Simon also in America, in England, was talking yeah. about everything. everything. But 100% yeah. sure you were the pioneer on this one. I believe. I don't know. Maybe Jesper might have been slightly before or after. I, it's so far away that I don't yes. recall. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jesper of Shoegazing, another one of the originals. Okay. Um, I have a question for you. Before you said there was nothing real in, really in America, what about Alan Edmonds was already on the market at this time or they were not distributed in Nordstrom? Were they already powerful in the, Europe, in the US market? Yes. I mean, they were the exception. At this time, mm. they actually were a great brand okay. with a good value for money. Mm. But that was it. But they weren't, they were popular, but they weren't, I don't know how to put it. It wasn't like, okay, just as a salesman, simply. you were not yeah. trying to sell that. You were trying to sell some Italian shoe ah, okay. or uh, whatever because yeah. it was $200 more mm -hmm. and you wanted to make your commission. Okay. And so the Allen Emmons were there. They were good, but... They were the only ones, and they were very just, you know, kind of classic at that time. Mm -hmm. And so how, how the, the decision for you to go, because uh, I'm going a little bit fast forward now. Yeah. I remember you going to Florence, yeah. Italy, literally to study shoemaking yeah. at Stefano Bermer. How a decision like that, how old were you when you flew uh, to Italy with your suitcase, I yeah. suppose, and your yeah. dreams, yeah, pretty so much? I'll tell you. So... When I decided I'm going to start my, my own shoe line, I yeah. put together a five-year plan Okay. To from that moment until I launched. Oh, wow. That was the goal. Okay. I believe that, you know, in writing things down and, and making points of, of action, to so you're always going forward with something. Mm -hmm. So the goal was to continue working at Nordstrom because I still needed to graduate. Of course. And learn as much as I could about the retail side of the business. Mm -hmm. um, and then after I did that... I wanted to find myself working in Europe under one of the better shoemakers. So I had like a list of five. Okay. Um, Do you remember who was on the list? Well, it was Gaziano Gerling, yes. Stefano Bemmer, mm -hmm. I think maybe John Lobb. Uh, yeah, the usual suspect the usual for, suspects, yeah, for the yeah. shoe lovers, let's yeah. say. Yeah. And, you know, and, uh, and then after doing that, I wanted to learn more. I, that was kind of where my five-year goal kind of stopped because I didn't know what to think if I went to Europe and made shoes, how long that would take. So mm -hmm. I kind of left it ambiguous at the end. But definitely, I knew I needed to do that. Um, and so as I was working at Nordstrom, this is how fate happens. Yeah. 
there was a gentleman there who uh, whose name is Rolando Gambini, and his father was. You remember his name? Oh yeah, he's still my friend to this oh, day. Good, good, I owe good. him a lot of. St- he was my entrance into. Oh wow! So I tell you the story. Rolando Gambini <laughs> was the son of Giovanni Gambini, who is the gentleman that helped connect Nordstrom to the factories in Italy that made their private label stuff. Okay. And so private label is when a company, uh, a factory is uh, crafting shoes and when a company put its name on it. So it's called private label. So some people make their shoes in a factory and put their brand on it just for the people who uh, may not be comfortable with the, with, with the semantic. And so uh, Giovanni had put his son Rolando as like a, uh, an intern, apprentice. I don't know. He was just there. Mm mm-hmm on the shoe floor of Nordstrom, kind of watching us and understanding the retail, kind of what I was doing, but not getting paid. He was just there understanding the business. And, uh, and so he spent a summer there and we were talking one day and he was from Florence and we were talking one day and I had just read this five page spread about Stefano Bemmer in this magazine, menswear, the quarterly one. Mm -hmm. And I was looking at the shoes. I was like, wow, these are amazing. And, you know, looking at pictures of Florence, the Ponte Vecchia, as American, and you never, I've never even thought about Italy, but <laughs> uh, seeing, I'm like, wow, so I would love to work f- with this guy. Okay. And so I, I went to Rolando, I said, hey, Rolando, have you heard of Stefano Bemmer? And he's like, yeah, my dad is good friends with him. I'm like, no, that's really? Good. That's good. I said, okay, I got to take advantage of this situation. Of this course. Is, this is somebody telling me, here's your in. Mm-hmm. So I said, uh, this is a long shot, but do you think your father could get me a sit down with him? Because I'd love to go learn shoemaking. He said, I don't see why not. He said, when I go back to Florence, uh, I'll talk to my dad and it shouldn't be an issue. Wow. So he kept his word. He left America a month later. He said, Justin, you come whenever you want. In Florence. In Florence. Mamma mia. And so uh, that was like October of 2006. Seven, I want to say. Uh, and so in March, I, I went to, well, I knew that I didn't want to just show up without any kind of knowledge or skill. So I went, took some mm. shoemaking course in Washington State, very basic, like cemented shoes, but just so I could say, hey, I've done something. I'm serious. I'm That's not good. just some yeah. American kid talking. Of course. Something I needed yeah. to show him. Mm. So I went and I met him. I brought this shoe. It was a terrible shoe. <laughs> but I brought this yeah. shoe and I said, hey, I really would like to further my skills and, and work under you, da 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 mm-hmm. and, he, and he said, no problem. It was a kind of a, uh, well, we can honor his memory because he passed away in 2012 or 13, I think, something like that, yeah. Stefano. Anyway, it was a kind of a persona, mm. very strong personality. Mm. Mm. And what we can say about him that I think he was his kind of a, his vocation in life to give the chance to other people mm. because he did this with so many friends that we know today yeah, so and people. he was opening his doors, yeah, right? Definitely. What was the arrangement? You were working for him. He was not paying you, but he was helping you with the rent. What was the arrangement? Because it seems like a fairy tale like that, yeah. but I'm sure it was not exactly a fairy tale. You have mm. to do something. Yeah, so the goal was, um, it was challenging. So he was going to teach me. Yes. And then I was going to try to help after the apprenticeship sell his shoes in America. Good. Well, and that's a fair so, deal. Yeah. yeah. So the only thing is I was very fresh. You asked me at what age. I, I, I flew there at 24. Okay. So I packed up my life in America. I left everything behind and I just went to Italy. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so, yeah, I was there for a year and then I went to America with some of his samples and went around America to the Wilkes Bashford, Stanley Korshak, Lafoe, Bergdorf Goodman, all these stores. I sat down and tried to sell his shoes. Yes. I was uh, this young kid though. <laughs> and and at it this, didn't work very well. It didn't point. work. Yeah. Yeah. The problem was in this time, America was just buying name brands. They of didn't course. realize how yeah. good Stefano Bemmer shoes were. Yeah. They Even at Lefort, because Lefort was kind of ahead of his time. You know, this yeah. guy is, uh, is distributing the best brands in the world now. I mean, the best shoe lovers brand, as yeah. we can say. But it was not the case back in the years. No, Stephen could see it. But I think the problem was was they probably thought it was a joke they're like who's this 25 year old kid trying to sell these hand welted italian <laughs> shoes is this is this really happening yes <laughs> and that's the way they treat him at wilkes bashford they're like hey kid beautiful shoes but we'll see you later <laughs> 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 uh, 
And it's like, you know, I'm not, this is not a joke, but yes. I didn't take me serious at the time. So, and I think that now the new owner of Stefano Bemer is selling in almost all of those stores, which is course. funny. Of course, it is funny. They turned me down 20 years ago, but yes. now they all Of course, there. of course. They are more than welcome now. Yeah. Of course, of course. So that's the Stefano Bemer. So one year and a half, and you met some good people there, right? The, the, the team was good. Yeah. Stefano himself was Stefano, a very generous man, yeah, right? His brother Mario, who helped me, showed me how to shine shoes, taught me about presentation and shoe packaging. And then the team, you know, Kumiko Masako, who helped me a lot in She's shoemaking. She's still here, Kumiko, yeah. I guess. Yeah. She's still at Sifano Bemer these days. They both are, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They so are very running. loyal people. Huh? Yeah. yeah. I think Masako is head of Bespoke, and yes. then Kumiko, I think, heads up the shoemaking uh, school. Japanese people. Yeah. Well, uh, by the way, everybody is asking, why are there so many Japanese, in, mm -hmm. specifically in the Bespoke and the trade? Do you have an explanation for that? Maybe this is their state of mind, or it's, it's oh. close to the... Because Japanese are very uh, tedious in everything they do. They really push it far. Do you yeah. think uh, they have the good personality to do this job? Well, of course, because first and foremost, with shoemaking, you need patience. And, yes. and they are very good at this. They're, and they are also very meticulous. And, mm -hmm. and, and if you want to make the most beautiful shoes, you have to be yeah. good. Speak with, a bit louder. You have to yeah. be good with perfection. And they take this to the next level. Yes. But I think they like shoemaking because ultimately i think in this culture they like to create things mm -hmm. whether it's knives or or whatever and for some reason they have a fascinations with certain mm. things like shoes like knives uh yeah I, that's I right know what I, else. I, I mean i would say even more globally craftsmanship in general yeah, yeah. it's very important for them so i know that you uh, were at stefan november but after you or before you big names went through this I don't know if we can say school or yeah. whatever, uh, you know, teacher or whatever, because uh, Daniel Day-Lewis, the famous uh, actor, right, yeah. St studied shoemaking there. And also Stefan Jimenez, our yeah. friend, yeah. Um, uh, our shoemakers from uh, Barcelona, Norman mm. Villalta went yeah. there. So that was a kind of, it's a, on France, we always say everybody one day or another went through John Love, mm. which is mm. true. Mm. But in Italy, it's that everybody one, <laughs> one day or yeah. another went in contact with Stefano Berman. Yeah. It was, uh, it was um, because there was a lot of people talking about that. He'd yeah. say, oh, I was maybe not the best shoemaker in the world, but this guy was creative, mm. was generous, and he was opening his doors. And this is something that helped tremendously, Definitely. I think, the market. And now they've taken it to another level with the school that they have, which yes. I think a lot of upcoming shoemakers will eventually pass through those doors. So you know, Exactly. Okay. We can say hello to Tommaso Melanie, who's <laughs> now the new owner <laughs> of, uh, of Stefano Bermero. And uh, I think they did a good job. They preserved the craft. And uh, actually, the store is magnificent. It's mm, in it's an beautiful. ancient chapel. Yeah. It's a beautiful place mm. to visit if you're in France. So that's your Italian moment yeah. right a no. year a year and a half something like yeah, that Yeah, around a year and then i yeah, i kept going back and forth and so i would do little stints here okay. and there and then this is where i appear in the picture with sonia <laughs> 2011 uh i was in london uh for dandy magazine if i remember well doing some kind of report on savile row and i discovered this young man he was working at number one Savile Row, right? Mm -hmm. Gives and Oaks. And he was the shoe maintenance and shoe shine and shoe petita guy in the middle of this crazy place because that's mm. a fantastic place. Gives and Oaks with all these historical uniforms. We're going to show you a picture. It's a fun it used to be a fantastic yeah, place. I don't know. It's what's the, yeah, I don't know. It's uh, a little bit more modern now. Yeah. And I had this young man. He was around 25 with his uh, big apron. Mm. And I said... How can a guy from Seattle, after coming to Italy, end up here at Gibbs and Oak shining shoes for uh, the gentleman of London? What's the story behind that? So this you know, I, I'm your unofficial biographer. Yeah, <laughs> there we go. So this one's a little more crazy and longer, but I, you know, making shoes, I got caught up in becoming a bespoke shoemaker. Okay. And I, and I, I realized when things started to go, not south, but like when... I wasn't able to sell his shoes, and and I was realizing that selling expensive shoes is is way more difficult. Yes. And and then he didn't really have a place for me because yeah he never paid me. I, you know I to get there I pretty much cashed out my savings and spent all my credit of card. Mm -hmm. And so I, I realized that I was hitting a wall, but it helped me because I 
I realized that wasn't my goal to be a bespoke shoemaker. My yeah. goal was to make shoes for the majority of men. Okay. And the majority of men cannot afford four thousand dollars bespoke not. shoes. Of course. So it kind of put me back on my track. So everything in my opinion happens for a reason. So at the time uh, I was in, you know, in Florence, I had met an Italian girl and we wanted to stay together, but I had to go back to America. So, um, you know, we decided to to go forward in marriage and, and that way we could continue to be together without living in two different continents. Mm -hmm. um, and she was tired of Italy and wanted to try something new. Okay. And she said, hey, do you want to move to England? UK. Yeah. yeah, and I said, why not? Uh, in London, I think I can make, I can continue with my goals because this oh. is the, the mecca of, of shoes. Yes. And and I thought to myself, I could reach back out to Gatsino and Gerlin. So they were the actually the first people I ever wrote. Uh, you mean Stefano. Tony Gaziano and yeah. Dean Gerlin. Yeah. Yeah. Hello, Tony. Hello, Dean. We hey. know these people very well. <laughs> yeah. They are, well, we can say they are big names. Or, yeah. I mean, the same kind of spirit because Tony Gaziano, I know Tony more than Dean, but mm. you know both of them very well. He has also this... Uh, state of mind yeah. is is opened, right? Yeah. You, 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 you. It, as far as I know, you are allowed to go in his factory during the night and see things. Uh, tell us this yeah, story; it's very yeah. interesting. So, well, it's funny. The first shoemakers I ever f felt enamored by were G and G, and my dad had brought me a Rob Report magazine, and okay. it was their first ever big publication. Mm -hmm. And I remember seeing this diamond cap Oxford. And I just thought, wow, these are so different and beautiful. And I wrote. Tony and I said hey I'd love to come make shoes uh, and learn shoemaking and this is right when they opened and uh, and Tony actually wrote me back which is you know was surprising yes especially if you think about you know just the amount of emails somebody can get yes and he said hey thanks for your email really appreciate it but as a new company we just don't have the time or the resource to take on apprentices at the moment but mm -hmm. please keep in touch so Good. I took that word from him please yeah. keep in touch yes. so fast forward now i'm moving to england but i'm actually moving to brighton which mm -hmm. is an hour yeah. and a half south of london mm -hmm. and i wrote tony and i said hey tony i don't know if you remember me but i wrote you a couple years ago you said you didn't have time and resources i'm moving to england i've made shoes now i did a apprenticeship in italy yes i'd love to come say hello meet you guys and pick up our discussion mm -hmm. so and he answered again yeah he wow. said he said come when you want this is called a gentleman yeah yeah he said when you arrive feel free to come when you want and we'll 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 meet you mm -hmm. I said great so when i got there not realizing how far things were you know it took me four hours to get to kettering from brighton <laughs> Of course. So I go there. And I driving on the left side of the road. <laughs> yeah. By the way. <laughs> yeah. I go there and I present this shoe and they meet me and I meet Tony and Dean and they look at it and they're like, well, obviously we see you have some potential. Mm -hmm. We think to work at our place, you need some refinement, which was fair. It was true. Of course. And they said, well, in all honesty, we just took on an apprentice. That was Daniel Wiegand. Mm. And we don't have room for two in the sense they couldn't dedicate time to me of course. or pay me. Mm -hmm. But they said, you can use our facility when anytime you want. you want. That's cool. And so I said, okay, that's amazing. But it wasn't feasible for me because I needed of to course. pay it was rent. Sufficient, yeah, of course. I yeah, I needed yeah. to make money. Yeah. And so uh, I let go of the idea of working for them, but I wanted to keep up my my skills i wanted to still make some more shoes to just further my knowledge mm -hmm. and so i went another route as far as a job but i would go up on the weekends i did this once or twice twice two or three times and i would stay uh in kettering and me and daniel wigan would make shoes to like two in the morning in the factory wow yeah just for learning by just yourself. for learning yeah yeah, yeah. 
Uh, and that, oh, Daniel was doing it to get better. I was doing it to just further my knowledge. Mm-hmm. And yeah. And so. And, uh, what about Gives and Oaks? So you did. You were looking for how to pay the rents. Yeah. So you decided. Yeah. But you wanted to say to stay somehow, if possible, in the shoe world. Yeah. So you decided that. Did you suggest to them to open a shoe shining no. place, or they were need needing somebody? They were needing somebody. So. We kind of skipped, but I had already, by this time, I yeah. had already started the blog. So I was already making... That's right. A in this, in, during these years, yeah. Yeah. In London. Yeah. I had already started making a name for myself okay. uh, in the shoe world. Mm-hmm. And so as I'm in England and I'm looking for work, I took some silly job in Brighton selling clothes. And uh, I get an email from the shoemaker's Caraducker. Yeah. They, yeah. Are, they were inside the premises of Gives and Oaks. Yeah. yeah. So okay. they wrote me and they said, hey... We know this is probably not something you want, but Gives and Hawks is looking for a shoe shiner, and yeah. we know that you know how to do this. Yes. And and this door's open if you want to take it. Mm-hmm. And I said, of course, I have a degree in business. I make shoes. I don't really want to shine shoes, but hey, I knew that this was going to be a good entrance into the world I needed to be in. Yes, and I must add that at this time, you know, I would say maybe 15 years ago, shining shoes was looked upon like, you know, the people who are, you know, bending on your feet at the airport and doing like even spitting on your shoes. And mm. it was like kind of a blue color work, you yeah. know, not really even uh, actually for immigrants or whatever. But mm. the situation changed, probably starting with you and a few others mm. that gave almost a, a novelty things to this to this craft and then little bit and now the people who are doing patina so they're not looked upon as no. just shoe shiners it's a very different it's all a matter of perception mm-hmm. and i remember this is where we met each yeah. other in mm-hmm. gives and oaks and i thought this young guy doing beautiful job and it's a very rewarding job actually when you do it right people yeah. people are super happy when mm-hmm. you do a very refined job in patina and shoe shining and i think the perception probably with you okay it started in the 80s 90s in france with uh, olga berluti mm-hmm. that she really you know put this idea of patina back uh, on the market was a big success and then with people like you and maybe a few guys in france and a few guys in italy these things start, start to take off literally and i think it's just my analysis but uh, i think it's it has also to do the revival of nice shoes and and shoe brands like you quality shoes and the patina goes in my opinion hand in hand so gives an oaks shoe shining and i remember i got memories where i tried to remember with sonia yesterday night taking you we were at the Duke's Hotel or something like that on St. James, right? Opposite of the Lub Bespoke. Uh, and then we were taking you to dinner and we were chit-chat a long time. And I remember at that time, you were telling me, oh, yesterday night I was uh, at the, with Daniel Vegan at the Gaziano and Girling factory to, to, uh, to learn by myself. So, well, what I can take away already, and then we're going to continue because uh, soon after that, I remember you saying, I'm going to build my brand. And with Sonia, we were like, well, okay, this guy is, uh, well, I'm sorry, we can say he has balls, you know, he has stomach to fly to America to try to find his way in life. Okay, well, there's something we can already take away from all this story. For us, it's a, it's a, it's a blast to, to bruise this because we know each other very well and it's, it's formidable for us to share this history. But there's something that I already take away from everything that what Justin said is history is that I think the key word of that is perseverance because when you were touring in America trying to sell shoes and then it didn't really work you didn't care you didn't surrender and say okay I want to do that so perseverance is something it's kind of a value I'm sorry I don't want to look that old grouchy guy who is preaching for things were better before but perseverance is a very very important thing you know that you want to do something Everybody has a chance, but you just have to put your body in the middle of the battle, because otherwise nothing is going to fl- fall from the sky. Even if sometimes things are falling from the sky, this Gambini, Gambini guy in, in Nordstrom when you were a kid, and then Stefano Bemer, and then Carrie Ducker saying gives an ox, uh, needs some help, and, uh, and um, uh, Tony Gaziano and Dean Girling opening the doors of your factory. So, but in a nutshell, It was not an easy path, right? You had to work your ass off, basically. 100%. Yeah. (laughs) It was a lot of 
scary times i guess one would say when you're in the middle of it maybe you don't think about it but yeah you know times yeah. where i had no money mm. i had nothing and but things magically fell into the sky and i always jumped on them yeah so, so how did you progress for so you stayed at given hope like a couple of years three years two years two years yeah and mm -hmm. so once i got a job now i could pay rent yes i needed to go back to focusing on the shoe company mm -hmm. so i was you know going to gng learning there i would spend time with uh tony tony would show me pattern making last making are you mean him physically he was showing you the thing yeah yeah wow, i would go good. up there he was usually very busy on monday through thursday fridays so he had some downtime we'd mm -hmm. spend a couple hours together yes we'd play ping pong he would always beat me <laughs> and and then he would show me some stuff yeah and then uh and then i would pick dean's brain about the business side because dean handles more of the business aspect and i would ask him about business and stuff and so they're really good with helping me mm -hmm. and uh and so the only thing i was kind of missing was more design so as i was living in brighton and i was going to gives and hawks mm. every day are you commuting i every was day? commuting about four hours every day and so from uh, i was living in brighton on uh, just right off the seaside and commuting to london which was about two hours door to door and one hour in the train mm. i have no background in design in art outside of drawing ninja turtles and wolverine when i was five years old six years old <laughs> okay i just started drawing shoes because okay. I, i needed to have a collection and the first drawings were horrible and i would erase and perfect my line and erase and perfect my line and erase and perfect my line until i thought i had something presentable to a pattern maker okay so i knocked out like i don't know 50 to 100 designs okay and then i said okay I'm ready. I'm ready. I feel I felt ready. Okay. So now I needed to go find a factory. Mm. Uh, But you needed money to to produce your samples. So how can that be? You just go yeah, tell us the story. I don't It's think not about, easy. It's yeah. not easy, yeah. I tend to fly before I can walk. So okay. I, you know, <laughs> I expect that the way is going to be shown. And okay. so I, I just first find the things and then when they say okay, you need money, I go find the money. Okay. So uh I was going to go to Mecom, and Mecom is a, a shoe trade show where the factories present okay. their stuff to gain new orders, new client, new private label clients, mm -hmm. etc. And so I had wrote to, uh, I was in contact with Marcos Fernandez, the founder oh, yeah, of, of course. Septem Lager. Yeah. And we wanted... Marco Fernandez, who was the... I think he, he was the importer of Doc Martens in France. He created Bowen. Yeah, Emeline. He was involved in... Yeah, Emeline Emeline well. also, yeah. yeah. He was... A, he was I, we can say he was the shoe guy in yeah. France, pretty much. Yeah. yeah. So we had wanted to meet, and I asked him, hey, are you going to meet him? And he, and he was going to go as well. In fact, I don't know why he was going to go, maybe just to meet me. <laughs> and then he said, are you looking for a factor? I said, yeah. And he said, well, if you'd like, I'll introduce you to mine. Wow. And I said, well, they make quality that I like. Mm -hmm. So In Almanza, Spain. In Almanza. He's yeah. going to save me a trip to Italy that I don't need to go. And I said, that'd be great. I'd love that. So we planned the trip together to Almanza to go meet the factory. Mm. And I had already known the quality because I'd liked his shoes. I'd reviewed his shoes before. And, uh, and, and yeah, because of his blessing, they took me on. So if we just step back one moment. So Mr. Gambini, mm -hmm. um, um, Stefano Bemer, mm -hmm. um, Dean Gerling, Tony Gaziano, Marcos Fernandez, yeah. we can say we have the people who chaperoned you, really helps you in your yeah. life. Yeah. Maybe we forget a lot of people, but yeah. these five people maybe made a difference for you? Definitely. In, in, in getting to the door to start my brand, those five people were crucial in this Incredible. aspect. Yeah. Wow. It's, it's important to credit this, Justin. Of course. Because we always say with Sonia, there's one thing that sometimes is a little bit, is maybe because I'm reaching 60, 60 year old. Maybe it's, it's, a, it's a path of life or whatever, but I, ha I, I notice a lot of people are forgetting this kind of mm. thing. Me, I remember very well who mm. helped me in my life, very well. 
I can say also who introduced me to the big Italian meals. He was an American guy, G. Bruce Boyer. Mm. Uh, we will always remember that. Mm. He's probably in his 80s now. Mm -hmm. He's a great guy. But I think it's a beautiful thing to remember who helped you. Of course. And, uh, well, it's a good lesson, people. And young, young people who are following this channel, never, never forget. It's so easy. It's much more easy to forget than to remember. So I'm happy that we can credit these people who are... Uh, except Stefano, who passed, all of them are still here, I yeah. suppose. Mr. Yeah. Gambini is still here also. Yeah. And he's there were these people who they changed your life. Yeah, you can say that. They helped you to change your own life, 100%. if we may say something like that. So, so you started making your patterns and then you found this factory. Mm -hmm. May I say that, uh, I'm sorry, we're not going to speak about shoes immediately, but this is <laughs> one of your first model? Well, this model... I show it here because this is a... This is, an, I would can say, is an iconic model that you uh, baptized Stefano in the memory of Stefano Bemer because mm -hmm. this saddle, Oxford, yeah. was um, was one of the iconic models of Stefano Bemer, right? Is that right? Well, it was a, it was at the time it was a bespoke sample. Okay. And every morning in Italy, I would arrive early, yeah. and I would just spend ten minutes looking at all the bespoke samples. Oh. And really, that ten minutes is what helped shape me as a designer. Okay. So I love Stefano's design, the fact that he took classic ideas, put his twist on it with colors or subtle pattern changes, mm. and really changed what I felt was a, a, a classic look into something, not contemporary, but just something slightly different. Mm. And I had loved the, I had always loved the essence of a saddle and the mm. way it, you can split the pattern of the shoe to make three, which I love to do color combinations yes. and multi-materials yes. and whatnot. Mm. And I feel that three-piece pattern really mm. is a beautiful uh, and way. And so it was one of your first design, we can say that, the samples? Well, so what happened is when he allowed me to make a pair for myself, yes, this was the this pair one. that I chose. Ah, and okay. so his shoe was brown and orange. I remember very well. Yeah. We're going to put on the picture. We have this uh, picture. We, we wrote on it on Parisian Gentleman. Uh, Everybody was mesmerized with yeah. this picture. Was, I remember orange and brown. It was mm. so beautiful. Uh, yeah. But I loved black and red. Black and red were my high school colors. And yes. I just liked the, you know, I'm not going to lie. For me, black just plain black Oxfords mm. to me are boring. Yes. So I wanted to spice up a black shoe. Yes. And so I wear this shoe when I have black tie events. Yes. And, and so that was my goal. So I, I made this shoe bespoke for me from Stefano's pattern. Okay. But then it was my goal to have this in my collection. Yeah. I tweaked the pattern a little bit so I didn't have the same exact lines. Of course. And then I named it Stefano. And you still, you still sell it? To, yeah. the, to this day, right? yeah. uh, 12 years after, 13 years after, yeah. and it will remain in your collection. Yeah, it's our, our staple. Okay, yeah. okay, so now we are at, uh, so you find the factory, mm. you start to have a possibility to build your own brand, so how did it work? How do you manage to make a stock? Oh, before that, the shoe snub blog was becoming Bo big. Booming, yeah. 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 And there's a question that everybody is asking, is that, isn't it of kind of a dichotomy where you're building your own brand and still to this day you speak about other brands? It's as if people don't understand that, but the, you were ahead of your time. It was like the internet way of thinking hmm. that you don't have competitors, you can also have colleagues. Yeah. And the fact to promote a whole market is also good for your own brand. But back in the years, people would say, how can that, it's like somebody will, you know, if you sell a, a Ford and you speak and you review, uh, you know, a Fiat, yeah. you know, it sounds a little bit uh, incompatible. Yeah. Uh, you decided this from the onset to, to do this or how did this idea come? So, is it a good question? It's very, it's, because it's people a, are intrigued. It's a that. great question. A yeah. lot of people ask um, and it comes in multiple stages. So, the blog actually was formed prior to the brand, three years before the brand started. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, my goal, I, I guess I started it for several reasons. The main one was when I was on my five-year journey trying to absorb all the knowledge I could. Yeah. I had questions, but there was nobody that had answers. Yes. And, and so I had to go figure things out myself, uh, you know. 
I joke about Tony and Dean at the time, they probably thought, oh, Justin's calling me again, you know, because yes. I would constantly yeah. ask them Ar questions. them yeah. for yeah. all the answers. Yeah. And I was grateful that they would give me the time. And so I thought I, I need to start a blog because I know I'm not the only guy with these questions. That's for and, sure. And in the future, I won't be. There'll be more people. And yes. so let me start something where I can document my, my journey and start answering the questions that people have. Yes. And so I created the blog. Um, at the same time, I knew that if I built a large blog, I would immediately have a following watching and waiting for my collection to arrive. Of course. So when I launched, I had a client base already. Exactly. I wasn't just launching yeah. with nothing. Yeah. And a few bloggers yeah. blogging on you, yeah. including myself Helping since the out. onset. Yeah. At the very, very much beginning. So. Yeah, yeah, I remember. And so, yeah, I coined it the shoe snob because I had very strong opinions. My, yeah. my dad actually gave me that name. Uh, my dad was a very smart businessman. At first, I wanted to name it something very boring. <laughs> the, I said the shoe aficionado. And my dad said, that's so boring. Who <laughs> wants to read the shoe aficionado? Right. You need to be the shoe snob. Mm -hmm. And you need to invoke uh, emotions in people, okay. whether it's good or bad. And the bad people are going to read you more than the people that like you. Mm, and he was right. <laughs> he was right. And yeah. I did it. And in the beginning, the blog was a lot more provocative than it is now. Yeah, I've toned down, obviously. Yeah. And, uh, and with the age. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I was young. And, bit, yeah. down, you know, when you're 20 something, you think you know everything in the yeah. world. Mm. And Same here. <laughs> of course. And so, uh, so yeah. So, the blog was growing and it was growing rapidly, almost more than I could handle doing everything. I remember. And, uh, and so, yeah, so as far as the factory now, so, mm. you know, I have the green light. Yeah. So I go, I, I, I make some samples. When the samples first come, they're terrible. Uh, yeah. Yeah, of <laughs> and course. I'm like, oh my God, what have I done? <laughs> and I call Tony. Of Get course, of course, my savior. I oh, say, okay. Tony, I need your help. I don't know what's going on. Something's off, but I don't know how to explain Ex it. Yeah, I course. don't know what to do. Yeah. So he says, okay, bring me all the samples. So I brought it to him and he grabs, you know, the shoe and he tells me, okay, drop this line here, do this here, make them pull the pattern forward. And he tells me all these things that I wouldn't have a clue about. Hmm. And, uh, I took all his notes to the factory and changed them. And as soon as they remade them, they were all perfect. So wow. So Tony Gaziano, once again. Once again. Yeah, once again, he, he yeah. did his magic, yeah. literally. And, uh, but the, the, the factory were responsive on that. Uh, they, were, yeah. they were adapting. No. Maybe they learned a few, a couple of things of from course. him, basically. Yeah. And, yeah, well, the beauty of the factory, a lot of people ask me, why do you go to Spain? Yeah. And the, the factory that I work at, has always uh, allowed me to really be hands-on. Mm. Maybe it's a cultural thing. I'm half Mexican. We speak Spanish together. And they're very open where you can't go to an English factory and go in the production area. Mm. you got to sit in the sample area and that's where you stay. Yes. Yeah. But in Spain, I go in, we work together. I change production uh, processes okay. to enhance my shoes to make them different. Mm. And then eventually they'll use those and offer it to other people. But I go in there and manipulate and they're very susceptive to, to learn mm. new process because ultimately they were a boot factory and not a dress shoe factory. Yeah. You mean cowboy boots? Cowboy boots. Yes. So they're still learning things and they're happy to continue learning. Mm. Well, obviously this takes time. And, but yeah, when uh, if they're smart, they can't argue with a, a maker like Gaziano and Gerlin. Of course. Because they make some of the finest shoes the world's ever yeah, seen. Of course. So yeah, yeah. Of they're, course. they're smart to allow these changes to, mm. to better their own production, which will ultimately gain them clients in the mm. future. So at this moment, and we're going to wrap up this first episode. So at this moment, from the young kid who liked Nikes and wanted to be accepted then to your father, your father was supportive in your endeavor to become an, an entrepreneur, right? He didn't, because my father at the beginning said, oh yeah, I said, Dad, I want to be an artist. 
Uh-huh. My dad is a pastor, that passed also. Now they uh-huh. are somewhere else now, maybe they, they have a drink together. <laughs> but uh, daddy was not a little bit, he was like, uh, are you sure you don't want to be a banker or maybe an insurance <laughs> guy or whatever? And I said, no dad, I don't know what I want to do, but I want to write books, maybe broadcast. I didn't mm. know really. But he was supportive, he gave you a few, he was supportive. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, my dad has always been support, supportive of the entrepreneurial path. Oh, okay. When okay, I told okay. him I wanted to go to university, he said, uh, no problem, but you better pay for it because I'm not paying for it. Oh, wow. And he said, okay, if it okay. were up to me, out of high school, you get a job and you start becoming your okay. own boss as fast as possible. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So he was very much that route. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, re- but my dad, I have to finish on that, he was supporting me a lot also. And it's a great f- human being. Yeah. But he was of this ancient generation. He didn't really understand. The moment I published my first book, only then he understood. Mm. And for him, it was a, a piece of, you know, that was concrete. Mm. Because the internet yeah. and all that, they couldn't really believe it. Anyway, so uh, I want to wrap up this first episode. We're going to continue the story. But so from all this path to the Justin Fitzpatrick, J. Fitzpatrick footwear brand, mm. that was a, a process of, at the end, seven, eight years? Around seven, eight years. Seven, yeah. eight yeah. years. So from five to seven, eight. Yeah. And with a lot of struggle to make and meet and, and mm-hmm. to find the money. And I like your thing. I take away one sentence from Justin Fitzpatrick on this uh, first episode because we're going to continue our discussion is that I, I wanted to fly before to walk. This is mm. what you said. Right? I don't know how you put it. Uh, I, I, yeah. I prefer to fly before walking and then you fly and then after, well, if you have to walk, you find a way to walk. Yeah. Right? Something. And for a guy who is working in the shoe industry, this is a beautiful proverb. So we're going to stop for now. We are the beginning of the Jay Fitzpatrick footwear brand and we're going to do a second episode dedicated now on this brand because as you can see since the beginning and if you are american normally you're very impetuous in america you want to so you want to see what is the name of the shoe what is the price when i can get it wait we have plenty of time here we wanted to share this beautiful entrepreneur a path and journey and we give you an appointment to the next episode of Sotoral talk where we're going to really deep dive into the collection of justin fitzpatrick see you soon my friend bye bye